Hello and welcome to this lesson entitled Teaching Servants from 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 22 to 26. The title has a bit of a double meaning. Uh, the first meaning is it's this is about how to teach servants of God. But the second meaning is how how we are to be servants who teach people of God. And we'll study not only what these verses mean, but also I'd like to share with you the steps that I took to prepare the lesson, since it's about teaching. <laughs> so let's start with the learning cycle. The first stage of the learning cycle is to pray, and not to make God aware of our needs or to convince him to help us, but to set our minds and our hearts on him, to, to acknowledge our dependence on him for understanding what he wants to teach us in his word and to ask God to deepen our understanding so he can change our hearts for his purpose. The second stage is to read, and you want to have a plan to help ensure you're spending quality time in God's Word every day. Um, so some kind of a schedule that you can follow, and you can get off of it, deviate if you want to, but some kind of a plan, tentative plan. And remember that studying God's Word is a way of worshiping him, and so we want high-quality time when we come to God's Word. Read with a right heart by engaging in the Word. Ask questions. Seek deeper understanding that God can use to align our hearts and our thoughts with His. And, you know, write down questions or anything that's not clear. The, the third stage is context. We need to be really careful about reading a verse or a passage outside of context. The only way to distinguish between two, two, and two is from context. Without context, multiple interpretations can steer us from the truth. Read in context of the chapter or in context of the whole book. Hey, sometimes context between books is helpful, especially when there are parallel passages, as in the synoptics, or when you're reading uh, Samuel, Kings, and the Chronicles. So those areas, there's a lot of parallel passages, and context can be helpful. But your main thing is keep it practical. The context helps us to understand what God wants to teach us. So he can help change our hearts and our minds for his purpose and for our highest good. All right, well, stage number four is to study. This is, let's go deeper. And so why? Why study deeper? Out of, out of love and respect for God is the, is the main reason. How to go deeper? One very practical way is to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And another is go to the original language. And this might intimidate some folks, but hey, we don't need to know Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic these days. Um, there are online resources for free that allow us to click on any word to learn all of its meanings, the nuances of its, of its meanings and how it was used with just a click of a button there. And out of respect and reverence for God, we need to do the best that we can with the abilities that he gives us and challenge ourselves for him. Constantly feel like we're in the hot seat pushing ourselves um, out, of, out of gratitude for him. And then we come full circle again and we pray. We thank God for his help and ask him to help us continue learning and growing. It's a continuous cycle. So let's put this learning cycle into practice now. God, please help us to, to be free of distractions and help us to understand and be changed by what you want to teach us from, from these verses. And thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, okay, so I want to get with the text now. This is, this is the reading part. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 to 26 Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, under, in, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So this is the initial understanding. So I'm walking you through my process. I read these, I've read these verses before going through the Bible. Uh, so this is my initial understanding and questions. So verse 22, flee youthful lusts. 
hmm, is he talking only about immoral desires or does he have other desires in mind too? Why does he specifically mention youthful lust? Hey, check check that word follow in the original Greek because in, in English it's a rather general word. Verse 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they stir up conflicts, arguments is what I'm understanding that to be. Here, Paul seems to be urging us to avoid unimportant or ignorant questions. Does he mean avoid asking them, avoid answering them? What makes a question foolish or unlearned? So, verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. Well, I think this means he must not fight or engage in conflicts. Okay, but be gentle to all people, inclined to teach with patience. So it sounds like he's saying be gracious, patient, understanding. Don't be harsh, impatient, or condescending. Be attentive to those who want to learn the truth about God and be passionate about teaching them. And check the word strive. I I made a note to myself in Greek because, you know, I want to make sure that I'm understanding that one correctly. It's not a word that I use every day. And verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And meekness means that I think of my own ignorance and how God has brought people into my life to teach me. I depend on God, too. And by those that oppose themselves, it's a question here. Is Paul telling Timothy to instruct people who disagree with one another about the faith or the gospel? I need to look into that one. If God will perchance give these people repentance to acknowledging the truth. Hmm, maybe that sounds like he's saying godly instruction gives people a better chance to realize their need for repentance. So these are what I think. These are questions. Not sure. And this is why I'm going to need to study deeper. Verse 26, godly instruction helps us escape the snare of the devil who takes folks into captivity. They are trapped because they believe his lies without question. They have no idea that they're even wrong. They can't distinguish between right and wrong. Taken captive by him at his will. That one was really confusing. The devil's will, God's will. Study deeper to try to understand that one for sure. All right, let's go to context. I'm going to put the learning wheel, learning cycle back up here again. So earlier in chapter 2, Paul tells Timothy to be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, to commit what he has heard to faithful men who will also teach others. And he also said, remember that if we're dead with him, we'll also live with him. If we suffer for him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. And So he said, we need to study, give diligence, make every effort, fully apply yourself. That's what he's saying, study. Um, To show yourself approved, and there he means uh, genuine to God. If, If you are genuine about God, you will be making every effort to, to apply yourself in your relationship. That'll be a priority is what that means. Um. Shun profane and vain babblings because they increase ungodliness. He's telling him to do that, okay? In verses 19 to 21, Paul calls everyone who names the name of Christ to depart from iniquity. And he then compares the heart to a great house with gold, silver, wood, and earth. And he exhorts us to purge ourselves of the wood and earth. That's worldly obsessions and sin nature, which, of course, bring dishonor to God. Getting rid of the wood and the earth leaves the gold and the silver. Desires of God, that's the Christ nature. Um, So that we are vessels or instruments who honor God and are set apart for his divine purpose. When we accept Christ, he provides all the gold and silver we will ever need for honoring God. We cannot and do not need to earn more gold and silver. Jesus gives all of himself to us. The Holy Spirit gives all of himself to guide us. The problem is that we still have a lot of wood and earth in our hearts. That's sin nature, and this is what hinders our walk with God. We don't need to get more gold and silver. We just need to clear out the junk and garbage in our hearts and minds. So verses 22 to 26, they're they're giving us a picture of what it looks like to purge ourselves of sinful things and set our hearts and minds for honoring God. 
So let's go on to verse 22 for study purposes now. Now we're going to go deeper. So this, this phrase here, neoterikos epithumias fuge, this means to flee. We get the music term fugue, uh, flee or take flight from desires of youth or adolescence. And youthful lusts are not limited to sexual desires, nor are they exclusive to adolescence. If only young people had them, then why would Paul tell all of us to flee from them? These are lusts that started in our youth and are still in our hearts today. They're, they're excessive desires for popularity, acceptance, worldly success, achievement, and wealth. They are any short-sighted desires for personal pleasure or gain that take priority over pursuing God's desires. The word dioke, the one that I said means follow, well, yeah, it's more specific than that. Pursue, seek after eagerly earnestly endeavor, endeavor to acquire. This word in Greek also means to prosecute, to chase after someone vigorously and quickly. The Italian Bible translates this word as ricerca, from which we get our word research, passionately seeking after, in other words. And again, there's a music term, a type of music called a ricercar. <laughs> so it's in, it's in there. Um, the next one is dikaiosunen, means righteousness, virtuous, you know, in the nutshell, it means being as God created us to be in thought and deed. That's what that word means. And hey, do we live that every day? Going on to another part of verse 22 here. Pistin means faith, believing, persuaded that it's true. Um, and uh, the word translated as charity here, agape, well, this is unconditional love. And it's the same love that God has for the world in John 3, 16, okay? So, erenen, when we put our trust in Jesus to save us, he fulfills our greatest need, and that is peace, reconciliation with God. He sacrificed himself to give us peace with God. We must earnestly endeavor to be at peace with each other. So, I have a comparison here between uh, using Scripture to, to help understand Scripture Paul gave this same charge about two years earlier in chapter 6 of his first epistle to Timothy. And they're written about two years apart, as you can see here from the dates. So using Scripture to understand Scripture, we confirm that youthful lusts includes any foolish and hurtful lusts that lead us from God toward our own destruction. In both passages, commanding us to vigorously pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, peace, powerfully emphasizes that these virtues are elusive. We will not acquire them without sustained, zealous effort. To be clear, we do not relentlessly pursue these virtues to be saved or to be right with God. We intensely pursue these virtues because we are saved and are right with God thanks to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Our profound gratitude and respect for him fuels our passion to live set apart for him as he created us to be. This is why Paul says pursue with them who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, out of a sincere heart. Let's go on to verse 23. Moras. This is where we get our word moron. And yeah, it means moronic, stupid, foolish. And the next word here, apidutus, means untrained, uneducated, ignorant. This is where we get our word pedagogy, and this is without pedagogy is what it literally means, without training. Zetesis is a question, a debate, a seeking, a search, an investigation. That, that's what that one means. Uh, Paraitu means refuse, reject, decline, to have nothing to do with, to avoid. We are to relentlessly pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, but avoid engaging in foolish, uneducated matters. We have all different backgrounds and are at different paces, places in our walk with, with God. So what distinguishes a question as foolish and uneducated is not so much what the question is, but the heart behind asking the question. If our question is motivated by a genuine desire to understand God's word, 
and grow closer to him? Well, that's a good question. If motivated by selfishness, then it's foolish. And here's a couple of examples. The lawyer asking Jesus what he must do to be saved in Luke 10, 25. He really just wanted to know the least he needed to do to be saved, yet go on living as he pleased. That's a foolish question. Nicodemus also came to Jesus wanting to know how to be saved in John 3. But his heart was clearly different than that of the lawyer. Nicodemus didn't explicitly ask how to be saved, but his actions showed that he was genuinely wrestling in his heart to understand who Jesus is. And this is why Jesus responded by telling Nicodemus that to be saved, you must be born again. Nicodemus asked questions because he sincerely wanted to know Jesus. Those are not foolish questions. They're the same as what the lawyer asked, but those are not foolish because of the heart that he had. Going on, um, eidos hoti means knowing that, realizing that, uh, and gnosen means to, to, we have our word Genesis, to, to, to breed, to give birth, to, to spawn or produce. And machas is quarrels, strifes, conflicts. So foolish questions spawn conflicts and arguments is what this is saying here. Like verse 22, verse 23 also has a parallel in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So we can again use scripture to deepen our understanding of scripture. You can see Taken together, these two passages emphasize the importance of having nothing to do with asking or answering foolish, unlearned questions which are not motivated by a desire to grow closer to God. Paul's strong emphasis on this in both 1st and 2nd Timothy lets us know that we, we need to be very careful about our motivation for the questions that we ask. Going on to verse 24, as, as we continue reading these parallel passages, we notice a very important contrast. In 2 Timothy, Paul uses the expression doulon de curiu, which literally means slave of the Lord. This is one who, acknowledging God's sovereignty and supremacy, chooses to submit, honor, and respect God. That's really important to notice that. Living in submission to God, the servant of God must not strive with people. Ude makhestai uh, means that it is absolutely necessary that servants of the Lord not quarrel. We have a duty not to argue with either believers or unbelievers. But instead, we must be apion, gentle and kind in speaking. We must be gentle and kind, speaking calming words to all people, pros pantas, to all. Now, Paul is not saying that believers are to be passive or timid. 1 Timothy 6.12 teaches us that instead of quarreling with men, we must fight the good fight of faith. Instead of merely quarreling, we are to fight. The word translated as fight is the origin of our word agony and refers to an intense, ongoing struggle as in warfare. We have a directive from God to fight against the sin nature within us. Arguing with people, hey, that's the wrong tactic on the wrong front. The correct tactic is an all-out, full frontal assault, and the real front line is our soul, the dwelling place of evil and our sin nature. Going on to verses 24 and 25, Paul goes on to say that the servant of the Lord must be didacticon. This is didactic. We get our word didactic, able to teach, apt to teach. Now, he first used this word in 1 Timothy 3, 2, when he said that church officers must be able to teach. But here he extends the charge to all believers. Now, don't miss this. Teaching is nothing more than communicating knowledge gained from our experience. Some folks are more eloquent and experienced than others, but each and every believer has experienced the gospel and has some ability to communicate. Teaching is a skill that gets sharpened with continued practice. God commands each of us to teach, so of course he will help us as we trust him. Teaching is like throwing a ball. The teacher pitches the knowledge, but there must be someone to catch it. Teaching is most effective when there's someone who wants to learn. But not everybody is like this. Some people are apathetic. 
Some vehemently oppose hearing anything at all about the gospel. They hate who they think God is. This is why Paul adds that the teaching servant must be anexikakon, which means able to bear up to evil. In other words, the teaching servant of God endures, especially when treated unjustly or when inflicted with an undeserved injury. When met with indifference or opposition, the teaching servant leaves in peace, shakes the dust off his feet, Matthew chapter 10, verse 14. And again, he's not talking about being passive or weak. And prautete translates as in meekness, but you know, it means gentle force or gentle strength. Paul is referring to God-given power wielded with reserve and gentleness due to the believer's trust in God's sovereignty. God is the one who saves. We are tools he chooses to use. The next word, paiduonta, is the origin of our word pedagogy and pediatrics. It offers an even clearer picture of how and what we teach because it refers to training or instructing a child, pais, when teaching children. You know, when we, when we are teaching children, we, we teach with gentle strength. This is how you teach. And what we teach them is absolutely indispensable. We teach them reading and writing, things that they absolutely have to know. And the next word really is a mouthful here. <laughs> Antidiatithemenus. Antidiatithemenus. Boy, that is a mouthful. It means to oppose, to set oneself in opposition, to offer resistance. He refers to folks who oppose or resist the gospel. Now, this is very important. He's, he's not talking about false teachers, but the people who are led away by the false teachers. After being given two admon admonitions as the scripture commands, false teachers are to be turned away. But the people duped by false teachers or lies of the world are treated in a different manner. Paul instructs Timothy to treat them with gentle strength. There's no hint that these folks are to be shunned. We are not to become angry or harsh with someone who falls into error due to ignorance of the truth. Instead, we must seek his highest good by offering him an opportunity to see the truth for himself. Put his heart first. Following God's guidance, show him the truth as clearly and kindly as possible so he can realize it on his own. We are to have absolutely nothing to do with teachers who pervert or subvert the gospel. Teachers who pervert the gospel try to distort it. Those who subvert the gospel aim to undermine its authority. We, we need to watch out for these folks and warn them as Scripture indicates, but then, hey, if they persist, we must dismiss the false shepherds so they cannot lead God's sheep astray. In the second half of verse 25, Paul points out that teaching with patience and gentle strength offers folks a better chance to recognize and correct their error. They're more likely to change their heart and their mind to, and turn to God, not by force or coercion, but by their own choice. So let's go to verse 26. Only when they make the personal decision to embrace the truth can they ananephosin, which means become sober or conscious again. Paul is emphasizing that those led astray do not even realize that they've been ensnared. They're not even conscious. It's like they're in a sleep. They don't even realize they've been ensnared by the devil. Pagidos, which means trap or snare, it's the same word used in Matthew twenty-two fifteen, when the Pharisees tried to entangle Jesus by asking him if he thought it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. And if he said, yeah, then he's a traitor to his people. If he said, no, then he's a rebel against Rome. Paul is saying that people misled by false teaching are helplessly and unknowingly trapped by the devil. The teaching servant who instructs with patience and gentle strength offers these folks a better chance to realize and escape their enslavement. The word ezogremenoi often refers to prisoners of war who are taken alive, is what it means. And you know, if they're not ransomed, then they become slaves of their conqueror. In the Old Testament and in classical Greek, this word's pretty common, but in the New Testament, it occurs only here and one other place, Luke 5.10, when Jesus tells his disciples that henceforth they would catch men. They would be taking men alive, is what, what he said. We're in the middle of a spiritual war. We are all prisoners of war. 
Paul often referred to himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. But we get to choose our conqueror, Satan or God. If we go with Satan, we will be his slaves. But if we go with God, then we choose to be his bondservants, citizens of his kingdom, his children. We belong to him and we serve him, putting his desires above our own. He loves us and seeks our highest good. And he entrusts us with responsibilities in advancing his kingdom for his glory. And he graciously allows us to share in his glory. Satan, on the other hand, wants to deceive and destroy us. Choosing him means not choosing God. Not making a choice is choosing Satan. The two words, pagidos, exoglemenoi, therefore together they paint a vivid and frightening picture of people helplessly trapped by the devil in their sin without even being aware of it. As if in a deep state of sleep, they're not even conscious that they are slaves to Satan. Instead of being angry, impatient, or giving up on these people, we should desire that they would awaken from their deathly slumber, realize the snare that, that keeps them captive, and choose to turn to God for the purpose of carrying out his will. Although Satan and the devil are one and the same being, Paul carefully opts for the name Diabolu here. Whereas Satan means adversary or opponent, the name Diabolus means slanderer or false accuser. It comes from two, two parts, dia and bolos, which, which means to throw a cross with a casting net. Literally, that's what it means. And the, the gist of it is, this is someone who makes charges that bring down and destroy. That's where the throwing with a casting net means. Verse 26 is subtly drawing a very important contrast between God and the devil. Devil throws a casting net to destroy people. God throws a casting net to catch people, to save people. The devil takes captives without their knowing it. But God accepts captives by their choice. The phrase hup autu ace to ekenu thelema has two interpretations. Well, one is the ensnared or taken captive by the devil at the devil's will. And another interpretation is the ensnared regain their senses for the purpose of carrying out God's will. Taken together, these two interpretations point out what happens to those who go with the devil and why we awaken from our spiritual coma. Either way, we are subservient either to the devil or to God. We are not autonomous beings. Those of us who do not choose to be caught by God, to be saved, well, they will be caught by the devil to be destroyed. So the challenge is this. Be teaching servants of God to catch people for him. Following the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we are to win people for Christ, not by force or coercion, not by eloquent speech, not by dazzling rhetoric or gripping entertainment, but by teaching with patience and gentle strength. Thank you.